Welcome everyone to the 28th meeting in 2014 of the Infrastructure and Capital Investment uh, Committee. Everyone present is reminded to switch off mobile phones as they affect the broadcasting system, although some committee members may consult tablets during the meeting as meeting papers are provided in digital format. Uh, agenda item one, I would like to, to welcome James Dornan and Mike McKenzie as new members of the committee and invite them to declare any relevant interests. I refer members to my register of interests, no other interest to declare. I have uh, nothing to declare other than to refer members to my register of interests. Okay, thank you. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank Gordon MacDonald for his uh, very worthwhile contribution to the work of this committee and wish him well on his new committee. The second item on the agenda is to seek the agreement of the committee on the choice of convener. Now, all the members of the Scottish National Party are eligible to be chosen as convener of the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee, and I would invite nominations for the position of convener. Right. Uh, I, I would like to uh, nominate Jim Eady. Okay, thank you, Mike. There being no other nominations, um, can I confirm uh, that Jim Eady should be appointed as convener of the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee? Can we agree that? Agreed. Okay. Thank you very much. And at this point, I will hand over the chair to Jim, so we'll do a quick swap. All right. Okay, Jim. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm delighted to take on the position of convener of the infrastructure and capital. Change of lineup. Okay. Oh. And, and <coughs> Thank you. Um, I'm delighted to take on the position of convener of the infrastructure and capital investment committee, and I look forward to working with our excellent clerking team and members uh, across the committee to take forward our work programme in the coming coming weeks. Um, agenda item number three uh, for today is to seek the agreement of the committee to take item six in private. Can I ask members um, to agree to take this item in private? Agreed. Thank you. Uh, the fourth item of business today is to hear evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for Infrastructure, Investment and Cities and the Minister for Transport and Islands and their supporting officials as part of a general update on transport matters. I'm delighted to welcome Keith Brown, Cabinet Secretary for Infrastructure, Investment and Cities, Derek Mackay, Minister for Transport and Islands, Neil Langhorn, Sustainable and Active Transport Team Leader, uh, Roy Brannan, Director, Trunk Roads and Bus Operations, I think the prize for the longest title is for Stuart Leggett, Strategic Impacts Manager in Trunk Roads and Bus Operations at the Scottish Government, and also Aidan Greasewood. Greasewood, Director of Rail at Transport Scotland. Uh, good morning, gentlemen. Uh, if I could kick off our evidence session by asking um, the Minister, what is the Scottish Government's view on the UK Government's decision to reprivatise the East Coast Rail franchise? Hey, happy to take that, Kimina. First of all, congratulations on your appointment. Uh, would it be possible to make a short statement, first of all? Would that be OK? Uh, yes, that would be. Yeah. Uh, as I say, congratulations on your new post convener and I look forward to working with yourself in the committee uh, as we have done in the past. Uh, I'm delighted to be here with uh, Derek Mackay, uh, our new Minister for Transport on the Islands, and to provide a general update on transport matters. And hopefully I won't forget to come back to the question you asked just at the end of this short statement. Uh, I think you'll know that our spending plans are focused on sustaining the economic recovery through investment. Uh, we intend to deliver more than £3 billion of investment over 2014-15 and 2015-16, and that investment will support around 40,000 uh, full-time equivalent jobs across Scotland. That, of course, is despite cuts of 26% to our capital budgets in real terms between 2010-11 and 2015-16. 
Uh, ongoing investment in transport uh, connects regions and people to economic opportunity, and that contributes to our national social cohesion and helps to reduce the disparity between the regions of Scotland. Uh, our investment in Scotland's transport infrastructure, such as the Queen's Ferry Crossing or the duelling of the A9 between Perth and Inverness, uh, all play a key role in creating the best possible conditions for business success. We continue to make excellent progress in delivering our infrastructure investment plan. The Queensferry crossing is currently over 50% complete and about 80% of the contractor's procurement has now been completed. It is on schedule to be delivered in 2016. We have secured a further £50 million in savings, which means that the five-mile stretch of dual carriageway between King Craig and Dalradi on the A9 will be the first of the 12 duelling schemes to be brought forward, and is due to com be completed in 2017, uh, six months earlier than previously anticipated. Uh, construction is also underway to deliver significant improvements to the M8, M73 and M74. Uh, when the full programme is complete, uh, road users can look forward to more than 80 miles of new road surface, and that is equivalent to around 200 football fields for those who count the road surface in that way. Uh, other transport major projects are advancing as planned. Uh, track laying has commenced on the Borders Railway and is on target for completion by the end of 2014. Uh, service commencement is also on schedule for September 2015. On 5 November 2014, Network Rail announced the award of a £250 million Edinburgh-Glasgow improvement project uh, alliance contract, which will deliver the Edinburgh-Glasgow electrification by December 2016. Uh, contractors are on site, and the first physical works, uh, which include piling, are already underway. On 28 October, uh, speed limits for HGVs on the A9 were increased from 40 miles an hour to 50 miles an hour on single carriageway sections between Perth and Inverness. And we're also making more improvements to safety of the route with average speed cameras now installed and operational between Dunblane and Inverness. Uh, we're keen to address issues on the northern section of the A9 as well. As part of the necessary statutory process for the Berrydale Bray scheme, uh, local people and road users were invited to a public exhibition in Berrydale on Wednesday, the 26th of November, following Transport Scotland's publication of the draft road orders to address the Hairpin Bend and Steep Hill. Uh, preparatory work on the Aberdeen Bypass is nearing completion with full construction due to start shortly. Uh, announced in early November the advertisement of £70 million worth of subcontracts for the Aberdeen Western Peripheral Route um, but, and the, also the Balmeri to Tipperty project, which is part of that project now. And that package itself totals around £221 million. Uh, and just last week, I was delighted to announce that we had now been able to bring the completion date forward to winter 2017. Uh, and that's quite unprecedented. Uh, since overcoming all the legal challenges back in October 2012, we've done all we can to accelerate the procurement and construction of the AWPR and Balmeri Tipperty project. And hard on the heels of that comes news that the preparatory work for the Harrigan scheme is now underway, and that will ensure that that improvement scheme is ready to go as soon as the AWPR is finished. Uh, the site work for the scheme is expected to be completed by the end of the year, with draft road orders expected next summer. Uh, and construction work to uh, remove a notorious bottleneck on the A96 at the Inveramsey Bridge will start before the end of the year. Uh, I believe convey that uh, forms a, an impressive package of transport infrastructure improvements that we're delivering for the North East in particular. Uh, and alongside the transport infrastructure projects I've mentioned, we're successfully taking forward uh, many transport initiatives. Uh, the Government is committed to public transport and to our ambitious climate change target of reducing carbon emissions by 42 per cent by 2020. Uh, and we have made further progress in these areas, for example through Round 5 of the Scottish Green Bus Fund, which saw the Scottish Government allocate £3.7 million towards the cost of purchasing another 83 low-carbon emission buses. I should also mention, of course, there was news this week that Alexander Dennis in Falkirk has attracted a new um, contract for around £300 million to build buses in Canada. And I like to think that we've helped play a part in that by uh, some of the contracts which they've successfully won in relation to the Green Bus Fund. Uh, that will bring the total uh, number of low-carbon vehicles in Scotland's eco-friendly bus fleet to 209, uh, and the Scottish Government is committed to improving bus services in Scotland. That's why we're providing over £3 million worth of funding over the next two years under the second round of Transport Scotland's Bus Investment Fund. Uh, Thirteen projects, including interchange hubs and community transport, will receive grants, helping to improve the standard of bus services, increase patronage, uh, and thereby achieve a greater modal shift. <laughs> 
Uh, as you'll be aware, convener, the two rail franchises have now been successfully awarded. The existing Caledonian sleeper service will be transformed with new rolling stock operational by 2018 and locally sourced catering. Uh, the new ScotRail franchise will provide at least 80 new trains with 23% more carriages across the network. Uh, new electric trains will be delivered for services between Edinburgh and Glasgow, and smart ticketing will be rolled out over the network. Uh, a dedicated mobilisation team in Transport Scotland have uh, been put in place to ensure a smooth handover from First ScotRail to Abellio and to Serco. Uh, the Scottish Government aims also to get more people making active travel choices to improve their health and to benefit the environment by reducing greenhouse gases and pollutants. During this year and next, we are increasing our expenditure on cycling and walking infrastructure by a further £27 million to deliver projects that promote active travel for everyday journeys. And I recently unveiled the Scottish Government's long-term vision for active travel, which aims to encourage more people to walk and cycle for everyday shorter journeys. And it focuses on areas such as infrastructure, transport integration, cultural and behaviour change, as well as community ownership and planning. And that vision was very much a collaborative effort uh, between myself and the active travel stakeholders. Uh, that's a brief uh, overview, convener. I hope it's helpful to the committee. And to come back to the question that you asked about the view that we have of the decision of the UK government to, as has been termed, reprivatise the East Coast Main Line, uh, I suppose for many people it raised eyebrows because it was a very successful um, a, I was going to say franchise, it was obviously directly operated, but it was returning uh, substantial amounts of money to the Treasury and was well received, well regarded by uh, users. But it was in the end, uh, despite the fact it comes into Scotland, a decision for the UK government. Uh, so what we did was to make sure that we were consulted and we put forward the interests of the people uh, in Scotland that will use those services. Can I just ask you on that point, what um, input did the Scottish government have in the specification of the new Intercity East Coast franchise? Well, we asked to be consulted, which hadn't happened in relation to previous franchises, and uh, our response to that was to make sure that we maintained the services which were there. Um, it's quite hard to see how the various things that we asked for, so in relation to things like Wi-Fi, uh, frequency of services, improvement of services, it's quite difficult to see, even though that the contract has been announced or the, the successful bidder has been announced, exactly how successful we've been in terms of our representat representations, because that level of detail is not available, but there are um, some uh, issues, for example, we wanted to continue to make sure that the services uh, continue to go through to Aberdeen, perhaps more services to Aberdeen. So we're still waiting to find out how effective uh, our contribution or our representations have been uh, to the, the UK government have been in terms of the final package of services. But it seems from what we know so far, uh, and Aidan would be, answer, be able to answer in more detail, that most of what we'd asked for seems to have been accepted as, as part of the basic package, and we'll find out more in the coming weeks. Okay. Is there anything more that you can say in terms of how you intend to monitor progress in delivering uh, those requirements to ensure that the, the quality and frequency of the service uh, in that part of the East Coast uh, main line is, is as good as it should be? We, we have no role at, at all in relation to that. Obviously, we can make representations and we can take up issues which are... Uh, given to us uh, from users and other stakeholders, but the monitoring of it will be done by uh, the UK government. It's their franchise, and they'll be the ones responsible for monitoring. monitoring. I don't know if you want to say any more about that, Aidan. No, nope, that's, that's right. And in terms of the actual rollout of more frequent services and the, and the sheer quantum of extra services to Edinburgh, for example, and the number of four-hour services, which was one of the things that we made representations about, and the speed at which those delivered, that, that's, again, the detail that we still need to um, get from the Department for Transport um, and then, uh, as part of that, there'll be milestones, presumably, in terms of delivery, and they'll be responsible for making sure that the franchisee um, meets those milestones. Adam, you'd like to come in? Yeah, I just wonder what some of the asks that you made of the UK government. Um, obviously, there are significant features of the ScotRail franchise, like payment of the living wage, um, uh, taking on apprentice, uh, apprentices, um, no compulsory redundancies. These types of issues were they were they um, uh, asked of the UK government to include in the, in the East Coast franchise? Hey, can I ask the Minister for Transport for responsibility uh, to answer that question? Well, that's um, certainly something that we've been exploring in terms of the successful bid and unpicking the successful bid because some of the information we have comes through the press release that does talk about training. But if you ask specifically on the living wage, we're yet to determine whether the UK government's Department for Transport uh, 
decision means the living wage for those workers. Uh, we have clarity in our own franchise that it absolutely does include the living wage, but we haven't got that clarity yet uh, from uh, the, the outcome of this specification. What we do know from what uh, we submitted as you know, important in terms of the transport uh, requirements have largely been achieved, but we need to see the full uh, detail, uh, of course. Uh, but we'll always be ambitious and, and, and seek more for Scotland, but particularly in relation to the employment matters. We don't have that detail, but we were quite uh, specific around the, the living wage and can expressly say it's been delivered in terms of our franchise, but it doesn't seem clear uh, for this route by uh, the UK Government. Uh, Alec, you have some questions on the ScotRail franchise. Yes, thank you very much, Convener. The, the success of rail travel in Scotland has been quite spectacular uh, in recent years. And just to look at the figures that uh, I have in front of me, in 2004-05, uh, there were 64.2 million passengers, and in 12-13, uh, only nine years later, there was 83.25 million passengers. What I wanted to ask was, has that increase in passenger numbers actually allowed you to secure a better deal for the taxpayer? I think it stands to reason that it has. I think it's hard to be specific about how that's been achieved. I think the latest figures actually are 86.3 million, because obviously we've had some more figures since the last ones you mentioned. And obviously it does, because when people look to bid for the franchise, they take into account patronage, because that's part of their revenue, the, the fare box that they receive. So obviously that makes it more attractive to bidders. I think it, it, my view would be quite hard to say exactly how much more attractive it's made it to bidders or how to specify exactly how that's benefited, other than to say it's obviously the case, given the very healthy interest we had in the franchise process for ScotRail, given what I think was an exceptional deal that we managed to get um, substantial uh, savings uh, for the taxpayer in terms of the subsidy payments that we have to pay. So, yes, there's obviously a correlation between increased usage, the attractiveness to bidders, and the keenness of their bids as well. How will the performance of the new franchisee be monitored during the course of the, the franchise? And what kind of penalties will be applied if they don't achieve the objectives of the franchise? Well, you'll know the current regime is that the penalties can be applied. It can be applied in a number of ways, but uh, you have a, a range of different ways of monitoring. So the Office of Rail Regulator will look at uh, things like performance. We receive regular, I myself and now uh, Derek will receive regular updates in terms of monthly performance, uh, how they've achieved their performance. We've had some exceptionally good months in the last couple of years, and then we've had some issues around, say, the Commonwealth Games, when we all knew there was going to be an impact because of the way that we configured the train sets to make sure we maximised the availability in the areas with the biggest pressure. Uh, but we have uh, the Squire regime as well, which has um, a criteria in terms of cleanliness um, of, um, of the rolling stock and how, um, how suitable they are for customers. So there's a whole range of different monitoring processes, and within that there are penalties which can be applied. I must say, my view in the past, and Derek will take his own view on it, is that the penalties uh, are often not a very good solution because what happens is if the ORR apply a penalty, a financial penalty, uh, so that simply goes to the Treasury, it's taken out of the Scottish Rail Network. So we'd rather see other remedies normally be applied than the financial ones, but they are there and they, are, they do act as an incentive to the operator to make sure they comply with uh, what's been um, specified in the contract. I, I don't know whether Derek or Ian want to come in on that at all. Um, no, that, that, that pretty much covers it. The, in your opening statement, Minister, you uh, spoke about uh, rolling stock uh, and replacement of rolling stock. I wonder if you would be able to provide any additional information on new and refurbished, refurbished rolling stock that's due to be introduced during the new franchise period, including when new trains will enter service and whether rolling stock they replace will be redeployed within uh, ScotRail or whether they will find themselves just being knocked on and into other franchises? Well, you're right to point out the, the fact that within the rail industry across the UK, it's often a cascade effect that happens. Um, but I don't know, Aidan, do you want to come, come in on that rolling stock? Just, well, on, on the specifics, there's the, um, the new electric rolling stock um, that's obviously tied in with the um, Edinburgh Glasgow Improvement Programme. So the rolling stock um, will be, um, it, 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 well, the first four trains are going to be um, uh, manufactured in Japan, actually, at the beginning of next um, year. And then thereafter, the, there's another 76 um, units that are going to be manufactured in, uh, in, 
in uh, Newton Aycliffe and the new Hitachi um, factory that there. And so they'll be rolled out, um, and, and those tie in with um, the infrastructure improvements through the um, particularly the Edinburgh Glasgow Improvement Programme. So the longer rolling stock, um, electric rolling stock on on the Edinburgh Glasgow route, and also the um, the Stirling um, Dunblane routes um, as well. So that's that's the new electric rolling stock, and then there's the refurbished high-speed trains that will be coming on um, end of 2018, um, and that's um, written into the contract too. So again, that will be fully refurbished internally, um, new livery as well, um, extra luggage space, cycling space, this sort of stuff. So that that's all that will come on stream um, end of 2018. Uh, on the subject of uh, rolling stock that might dis be displaced in Scotland, uh, will that find itself uh, either, if it's at the end of its life, simply being scrapped, but the material, the, the rolling stock that uh, is still usable, will that simply go into the, the marketplace and find itself redeployed across the whole of the United Kingdom? Um, yes, I mean, the overall, there'll be an overall increase in capacity of over, mm. uh, you know, well over 20 per cent across um, the network as a whole, so over 10 years. So that, that's consistent with what you're saying in terms of the, the passenger growth we've seen and, and we're encouraging in the next franchise. Um, but then, um, with all the electrification going on, there's inevitably going to be a surplus around diesel rolling stock mm -hmm. and therefore um, opportunities for cascading that um, to, to the rest of the UK network or, or beyond. Um, as you say, that's the way the, the industry is structured yes. through the Roscoe's, um, and, and that's the mechanism it works. Thank you. Adam, you have some questions on this? Yeah, um, Cabinet Secretary, uh, you're obviously aware of the, the correspondence we've had recently uh, about my asking for improved services and train services in my own constituency, particularly on the Glasgow to uh, Kilmarnock to Dumfries line. And your response was that there will be improvement in services, but we, we haven't got clarity on, on that yet. Perhaps. Maybe I could ask your successor when, when we're likely to have, have clarity on improvement, say, for example, in terms of frequency of service uh, okay. on, on these lines, not just in my own constituency, but across Scotland. I can maybe not give too much more encouragement <laughs> other than to say, as you'd expect, there is enhancements uh, within the service as part of the franchise in terms of capacity and ways of working and uh, quality of service as well. But as to the timetabling, then we'll be looking further at that, of course, in partnership uh, to, to, to see what amendments can be made. So any specific requests for improvements will be considered and taken up in a partnership approach. So we'll continue to look at it, and of course, before implementation, uh, clearly before implementation, uh, set out what the timetables look like. But we'll take on board, and I'm sure all correspondence and notes of interest and in how timetables and um, routes can be uh, improved will be taken forward and properly considered with a very constructive uh, partnership approach. I'm sure my MSP colleagues will take that as an invitation, uh, Minister, to have some more asks for you, presumably. It wasn't necessarily a bid for more <laughs> asks. I was just saying we're at the stage we're in discussion with the timetabling with okay. a successful uh, bidder. Okay. Thanks for that. Um, uh, uh, I also have another uh, railway line in my constituency which um, qualifies uh, for the Great Scenic Railway Scheme, um, the Glasgow to Stranraer line. Um, could you provide any more information um, on this scheme, um, including projected improvements in passenger numbers uh, as part of the scheme? We have a range of uh, ideas to take forward in terms of the uh, scenic uh, routes. Um, it includes uh, improved uh, Wi-Fi, uh, better design in terms of the views that can be seen uh, from the, the trains, better uh, facilities, and uh, ambassadors on selected routes uh, as well, and, and Scottish produce uh, on uh, selected routes. Uh, routes to, to promote kind of Scottish uh, food and drink. In terms of the ambassadors, they'll attend the Visit Scotland uh, tourism uh, training uh, course, and uh, we hope to uh, 
support specific lines and in addition some steam special services will operate in specified lines to promote local attractions and grow tourism but that's particularly on uh, the borders uh, route so we'll take advantage of the uh, tourist offer in Scotland and integrate that into transport in a way that's uh, better than what we had before through the use of ambassadors information uh, Scottish produce and uh, destinations and a sense of place as part of the uh, travel network. Now that in itself should encourage more people to, to use the trains to take advantage of the tourism offer as well as the transport function. Uh, main reason of course for, for using the train so we'll have better integration than we've had before. I think it's worth mentioning the fact that this was something that we didn't really have to push the bidder on. They were very keen to do this, and they've really fleshed out. Um, obviously, we, we encourage this kind of thing, but the, 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 uh, Bailey were very keen to do this, and it's been extremely well received in those local areas where the Great Scenic uh, Railways are proposed. So I think it will lead to, I mean, uh, uh, as Derek says, apart from anything else, the borders will be a new service, so that will be an increase in patronage in any event. But uh, I think this has been extremely well received in those communities where it's to be... Um, where it's to be implemented, and if you combine that with what we've mentioned before in the sleeper service with Scottish produce, you know, kind of gateway to Scotland, I think it's uh, one of the best aspects of the new franchise. Well, as the Cabinet Secretary knows, that the particular line I mentioned, um, uh, there are, have been concerns about uh, passenger numbers and, and the need to build uh, traffic or on that on that railway line. So. This marketing exercise is what I presume it is, basically, uh, with enhanced service, presumably as well, um, should should um, you know deliver results. I and mean, when would we know that? Uh, how how is this going to be evaluated on an ongoing basis? Well, first of all, I think it's worth saying that this will, the, the line you mentioned in particular will be also um, helped by the establishment of the Community Rail Partnership, a very active uh, rail partnership there. So it may well be the case, uh, it's up for Community Rail Partnerships to decide how they take these things forward, that they'll act as the best promoters and, and uh, marketers, if you like, of this new service. And you're right to say that um, passenger numbers in that route have been a problem ever since the change in the ferry port. Um, but this is a way really of adding a new dimension to that, giving a different reason for people to want to travel that line. Um, as to the timing of it, I don't know whether Derek or Aidan want to come. It's, it's a rollout, so there's refurb, and, and that's the sort of detail still to be announced in terms of the refurbishment of the stock, and that obviously takes quite a while, and we don't want to sort of take all the stock out at the same time. So, so it'll be a, a, a gradual rollout in terms of um, the routes that will become part of the Great Scenic Railways offer with the marketing starting. Um, in advance um, of that, but but from from 2015, um, you know, the, 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 from the off, they'll be starting that process. Well, I look forward to it. Maybe take a trip myself. Report back, uh, ministers. Um, can I also ask about uh, another feature of the Scott Rail franchise, which was um, the availability of reduced fares for job seekers. Um, it's a particular interest, uh, again, to my constituency, which is perhaps a wee bit peripheral in the city, in terms of being in the city region, and uh, Glasgow uh, is obviously a key um, uh, job uh, magnet, I suppose, uh, for people in the west of Scotland. Um, how, how do we intend to take this particular initiative forward? It's not just people who are seeking work, but perhaps it's the ability of people to actually take jobs um, if uh, fares aren't going to be excessively priced for, for such people. There is the, the wider issue of, of pricing of fares in terms of uh, linking it to, to RPI uh, in terms of, of peak and off peaks, RPI less 1% for, for standard uh, charging uh, over uh, the period, but specifically on job seekers, that's correct. There is the element of uh, a reduction for uh, job seekers, and the detail of that is yet to be determined in terms of um, the eligibility process and so on. But we'll work through that detail. But we're committed to providing that uh, discount as part of the franchise. And also the advance fares of five pound between cities as well. I, mean, I think it's part of 
you know, the wider part of the air quality agenda that you start to make it as easy as possible for people to access jobs. I think as Derek rightly says, the work that we've done now for a number of years to bear down on price increases, um, I know it's an issue for people. They have substantially lower increases than have been true of the rest of the UK, and you're going to see real terms cuts in terms of some of the uh, fares going forward, so we're well aware of that. But I think what the, the bidder has done is acknowledge that uh, by those most most likely to benefit job seekers in particular, uh, being able to get uh, cheaper fares, especially given the fact that you will then uh, also help modal shift as well. So, And if it gets people into the habit of using public transport at that stage, if they're just joining the jobs market, then it's a good thing. But um, I think it's a very innovative uh, thing. I should say, in relation to the £5 fare between the Scottish cities, that will obviously be an advanced fare. So. I hesitate to use the example of one of the airlines, but you'd really have to be in uh, you know, to, to make sure you book that in advance to get uh, the advantages of that fare. But uh, I think it's a huge bonus to people you know, between any, any of the cities in Scotland. The £5 fare will be very popular. OK. Um, and the final question I have to ask this morning in this area is what criteria will you use to decide whether to exercise the option to extend the franchise by three years? Well, there's no, we would look at um, performance in the round and all levels um, of performance, but essentially we enter the, the franchise in good faith. Uh, the, the break option is there if there's reason to break, if you know we're not satisfied with the performance to the customers of Scotland. So although we'd look at a range of measurements to make that judgment, essentially we would expect to fulfil the, the period of the franchise and use the break option only uh, if it's required and deemed necessary by the government at the time. Obviously there's a lead-in period uh, in terms of making that decision and then actual implementation, but we enter the franchise in good faith. Uh, James, you have some questions on the new Caledonian Sleeper franchise. Thank you, Convener. Uh, can I first of all start by congratulating the Cabinet Secretary and Minister on their new portfolios? Uh, I, I do have a, I've got a number of questions around the, the Sleeper contract, but the, before I do, I've got to say that I think that given the way the contract reads, it does appear as if it would, it would be a good deal, and I agree with you. Robert Samson from the Passenger Focus, who said that it looked like it was going to be a good deal for passengers. However, uh, given the contract went to CERCO, and there are some issues round about CERCO, uh, I, I do think that we should be looking to deal with them. The, they entered the, the partnership with Inverlochy Castle Management and Albert Rue to manage and operate sleeper services. Can you explain who will be responsible for which aspects of the sleeper service? So what was the last part of the question? Can you explain which, uh, who will be responsible for which aspect of the sleeper service? I, well, I've turned to official them up. Well, can I just say, it's CERCO that have the contract, so they have a responsibility for all aspects of the contract, even though they have agreements with the two organisations you've mentioned. So CERCO are the ones that we will hold to account for delivery of the contract right, in all so its aspects. The division of, of the management will be yeah. decided by CERCO. That's, that's fine. The, the, a number of... Uh, Financial issues that were raised with Circle before. Uh, what guarantees do we have that Circle can hold to the contract, given that the, for example, they were suspended for six months from bidding for UK government contract? Well, we've sought financial uh, reassurance uh, around the company and the provision uh, of services, and we're satisfied at the moment with the reassurance that have been given uh, around the, the finances. Uh, if for any reason uh, the franchise wasn't able to be delivered, of course, government has options in terms of operator of last resort, if that was required, but we don't believe that that will be the case, that um, notwithstanding the financial challenges you've identified, we've been reassured, and I've been reassured, that they should not affect the uh, service uh, that's uh, forthcoming. And so, you, you, just for clarification, then, you do have contingency plans in place? Yes, in of course, of yes. And, you know, ultimately, operator of last resort it would be there, but there's a range of options within that. But essentially, our question is about financial uh, capability and risk that there are at the moment, but we don't believe they will affect this franchise. So it's true to say that we have bonds and guarantees in place as well. Um, 
But uh, as Derek rightly says, we have, uh, and we regularly do with all franchise holders, we check on the financial standing of the operator and we are satisfied with the assurances that we've had. And in relation to the fact that they were barred from uh, taking up contracts by the UK government, that had stopped prior to this process coming to a conclusion. So we couldn't have, for example, have said, actually, you've recently been barred by taking by, from the UK government from taking up contracts, so we can't let you do uh, this contract. We, we couldn't have done that. It had, it had expired. They were then able, at the stage that they won this contract, to take up government contracts. So you know, if, for example, as has been suggested by one or two people, that we were to say no because we don't like your recent track record, then we would have been liable for... Um, they, they could well have launched um, a complaint about that and sought compensation for their bidding costs and other costs as well. But we were satisfied at the time that the contract was let. They were not under the stricture from the UK government that you mentioned. I do see that the UK government and the Welsh Assembly have both got the contract since, since that, so that would explain... As does Glasgow City Council. Yes, it's, it's got a longer run one, to be fair. Uh, the, the, the last question I have on this is... Uh, the full business case highlighted risks associated with locomotives that will be used by Circle to haul sleeper services. Can, we, can you offer an assurance that sleeper service reliability and punctuality will not be adversely affected by the introduction of these locomotives to the sleeper service? Yeah. We since sought that reassurance and we've, we've got our own technical experts in terms of just looking at the, um, the nature of the, the locos that they're um, um, using and the, the extent of the refurbishment and, and, and therefore assurance around the reliability and punctuality performance that we can expect from that um, franchise, yes. Okay, all right. Okay, thank you. Uh, can I just stick with the, the issue around um, the credibility of CERCO, given that they are being investigated by the serious fraud office and have had to repay over £60 million to the UK government and were banned from bidding for UK contracts for six months. And obviously all of that um, you would expect to undermine public confidence in their ability to operate flagship services um, as part of the Scottish Rail Service. And what further reassurance can you provide to the public that CERCO are indeed a company that are capable of delivering? Well, I think, first of all, our Circle are now quite a different company. Um, they've had some substantial changes and actually quite a degree of contraction in terms of the contracts they're involved in. Um, I think the company themselves have made statements about that, and it's, it's not really for me to, to get involved in, a, obviously, an ongoing investigation, uh, as you mentioned. But what we can do in relation to this is, first of all, to make sure the process that we've gone through is a robust one. And so we, ha we make checks on all the bidders, as we did with Circle, as to their financial standing. Um, and if you want to preclude somebody from bidding for a contract, you have to have very good grounds for doing that, which are robust and can stand up to challenge. They were not the grounds to preclude Circle from bidding for this contract. We have sought guarantees. Um, Aidan can perhaps talk about that in more detail in terms of the financial guarantees that we have. Um, we, we require bidders to be insulated from the wider group in terms of their ability to run this contract as well. So I think those are the assurances that we have. And as I say, we do continuously monitor that, not because we're particularly concerned about Circle. We do that for all um, contractors in relation to this. There was an issue uh, previously, I think, in the stock market for another uh, franchise holder where we uh, obviously sought further reassurance. So we do seek reassurances, but they're not just verbal ones. They are financial ones as well. Uh I hear what you're saying, Cabinet Secretary, and uh, I'm sure people will be um, reassured that the, the Scottish Government has sought and received uh, those assurances from CERCO, but they are a company experiencing considerable financial difficulties. I think it's right that the Scottish Government should do that. I think the public would expect them uh, to do that. Can I just ask you finally on this point, what contingency plans are in place should CERCO withdraw from the franchise? Well, then there are a number of options which are available to the government, and as we saw in relation to the East Coast Mainline, the government uh, became the operator of last resort. Um, we have, for example, um, shelf companies which you can then bring into being. You have to assemble uh, the expertise to order uh, to run a, a rail service uh, directly, but we don't believe we're in that situation. But the contingency plans are fairly well laid out in the legislation and in practice by the UK government. We are bound by the same legislation, we've taken the same precautions. Uh, but we don't believe those are going to be necessary. We believe that Circle can fulfil this contract. OK, thank you for that. Mark, you've got some questions on high-speed rail. Yep, thank you, Convener. Uh, uh, just to ask, uh, Ministers, um, what engagement you've had um, and Transport Scotland officials have had with the high-speed rail 2 company and UK 
to Park for Transport on high speed rail issues, particularly uh, the feasibility of high speed rail coming to Scotland? We've had a number of discussions over recent years. I've talked, I think, to three different uh, secretaries of state trying to get the dialogue with high speed rail um, and high speed to the company themselves. Um, and we have had discussions with them about that. What we've done during those discussions is to make clear that um, uh, there seems to be a, a tendency when UK ministers talk about this to talk about the benefits of high speed rail coming to Scotland. What we've done is to make clear that what we want to see is high speed rail coming to Scotland, not just benefits that might add on from high speed rail uh, south of the border. Uh, so I think just now we have a, a relatively constructive dialogue and we await the outcome of the joint study which has been undertaken and which we are cited. Uh, it's been undertaken by HS2 uh, and we'll wait and see what they come forward with. But we've been very clear. Um, I think it might be true of most of the parties in the Parliament as well that we want to see high-speed rail come to Scotland. That's where the real benefits come in. We've also made the point to them that um, doing it in this relatively piecemeal fashion, announcing add-ons and so on, is perhaps not the best way to go about the contract. Um, there are many reasons to suggest it would be more straightforward, not uncomplicated, more straightforward to start um, a high-speed rail link from Edinburgh and Glasgow uh, to London from the north. Um, we don't have quite the same weight of uh, issues that they have, especially coming out of London. Um, and also it's true to say that you don't have to start uh, a, a railway line of that type uh, in one point and move from point A to point B. You can do it along the line as we're doing in the border. So these are the points that we've made to them. We are pleased that we have the dialogue with HS2 that we asked for, but as I say, we await the outcome of the joint uh, study. What's the, the Scottish Government's views on the comments made by the chairman of the HS2 company um, where he said it was much more likely that um, upgrades of existing rail lines, um, that, that that would be much more likely than the HS2 coming to Scotland and also his um, comments that the, the joint discussions between uh, the two transport um, departments on high-speed rail lines are, are running behind schedule. Yeah, well, I think uh, my, my view on those comments are, of course, um, David Higgins has to take his steer from, um, you know, the um, Department for Transport. So the much more important issue behind this is a political one. If you can get buy-in from all the political parties to the principle that high-speed rail should come to Scotland, then I think it strengthens the hands of David. Uh, I think he's um, someone we've got a lot of time for, we know, um, but he will have to say what he has to say, uh, given the political direction that he gets. Um, I, I think he's well aware of the situation in Scotland, the benefits that would accrue. I mean, it, it's very obvious to most people looking at it that the real benefits in terms of uh, economic uh, regeneration uh, and also in terms of modal shift come if you come all the way to Scotland. That's when you get, if you can get sub three hour journey times from Edinburgh and Glasgow uh, to London, which it may be possible to get if you were to do um, some of the refurbishment that's been talked about. We have to wait and see what the joint study says. But if you want to get real modal shift, it really has to come all the way to Scotland. The central belt of Scotland is the second most economically active area of the UK after the southeast uh, of England. There are real benefits to the rest of England and the rest of the UK if you have that link all the way there. So I suppose my point is, and I've said this directly to um, the UK government and others, uh, that we really want to see high-speed rail come all the way to Scotland. That's where the real benefits um, come. But behind that, it's, 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 you know, let's not pretend otherwise. It's the politicians that will be driving this, and I think it's the politicians that we all have to convince that this should happen. Thanks for that. You mentioned the, the central Scotland um, area of economic activity and have been plans for an Edinburgh-Glasgow high-speed rail line. Are you able to give an update um, on planning, on feasibility for that edinburgh Glasgow high-speed rail line? Yeah, we are looking at that just now, as I've said previously to the committee. It was our idea that, obviously, that's predicated in large part on the idea of a high-speed rail link coming from the south. That's what makes uh, sense for it. So I think we want to see some more information from the UK government before we take much further the uh, <coughs> possibilities of high-speed rail between Edinburgh and Glasgow. It makes sense to, to make it part of a high-speed rail network. That's what we want to see. That, that fundamentally affects the viability of that. So I think that's what we want to see. And obviously, the joint study, which I've mentioned, before and hopefully a new direction from the UK government uh, coming out explicitly in favour of high speed rail to Scotland would help us with that uh, process. Finally, if I remember correctly, and apologies if I'm wrong, but the budget line on high speed rail 
um, from last year to the, the upcoming budget has reduced. Are you able to tell the committee why mm -hmm. that is why that is the case? Well, again, it's tied in with the, the minister's previous answer about waiting for the results of the joint study. Um, so it was always just planning work. So the budget was around planning work. The actual, obviously, the, the scale of investment you need to actually take it forward would be in hundreds of millions and, and plus, rather than the, the few million pounds that you're talking about. So I think it's down from about four million to, to one or two million from recollection. But essentially, that's, that's planning work involved in the business case development we were talking about and taking forward work subsequent to that. But we're, we're waiting for the uh, results of the joint study. Um, in order that we can give a fully informed picture to ministers around, around the options. Maybe to assist uh, Mr Griffin on the question between Edinburgh and Glasgow, in any event there's, there's major investment through the programme and the project between Edinburgh and Glasgow. Whilst it's not high speed rail, that improvement project will be substantial nonetheless. But, but any future investment, uh, and that answers the budget line question, all hangs on the joint study. UK government making a view and a decision, and, and then the partnership decision, then have knock-on consequences for us. But there will be improvements to Edinburgh, to Glasgow, and Glasgow to Edinburgh, nonetheless, through that improvement project. High-speed rail is all connected to the joint study in terms of the UK position. Okay, thank you. Um, Mike, you have some questions on the A83 and major trunk road projects. Yes, yeah, thank you, convener. And, uh, given the the vast territory of the Highlands and Islands. Um, I hope you'll indulge me just slightly. I think I'm the only member here with a, an interest in that, that area. Um, and, and, and just before um, uh, you, you, you know, getting into the questions, um, I would just take the opportunity of um, giving a bit of feedback to the ministers on the delight uh, about the increased frequency of the service, the rail service between Oban and Glasgow. Um, that's the first significant uh, improvement, I think, to that service for very many years. So people are really pleased at that. And um, I'll move on to the, the, the A83, rest and be thankful. Um, the one observation I would make before asking the Minister for an update is that, um, you know, in, in, in comparatively recent times, I remember uh, clearing the landslides seemed to take days. Now that seems to take place in a matter of hours. So um, I think, and I know I could convey that people in that area are thankful for that. Um, but to ask the Minister for an update on that, and also in, while we're in that area, um, Pulpit Rock, um, my heart used to sink when I arrived at Pulpit Rock and a frown would come over my face. These days, again, after many years, um, my heart is uplifted. Um, a smile comes to my face as I see the progress, but it would be interesting to hear you know, exactly what progress is and when we can expect completion of those works along with the adjacent Crane Larrick bypass. So um, I just wonder if the Minister can provide some updates in these areas. OK, uh, thanks very much, Mr Mackenzie, for that. Uh, a smile comes to my face when I hear of the challenges and... <laughs> 83 and rest and be thankful as well. It's, it's significant, of course, challenge with the, the impact of weather and the uh, landslides on the, the transport network. The task force will continue to meet to look at uh, the options available to us. A number of measures have been put in place, of course, to try and minimise uh, disruption and ensure that the route, when blocked, is reopened as quickly um, as possible. And some of the um, short-term measures have been very helpful, it's such as the netting uh, and some of the, the other uh, kind of physical uh, approaches. Uh, but Roy can maybe uh, cover the uh, specifics uh, that you've asked about. Yeah, thank, thanks very much. Uh, um, it's, it's heartening to hear the feedback in terms of the speed of response because I think uh, it's, a, it's a massive team effort to try and keep the road open. Uh, I think the first thing we've got to say is that our you know, fantastic landscape topography means that we just can't stop landslides from occurring, including the, the climate and uh, how we adapt to it. So it's an ongoing battle that we face, not just at the rest of me thankful, but across the whole of Scotland. And you know, as, as well as we've, we've got the 83, we've also got Glencoe, we've got Sky, we've got lots of other locations. And we actually undertook a study some years ago now that identified and risk assessed exactly where those, those high profile areas are. So we've got a good understanding of what we're faced with. And the, the approach is really about hazard risk, either reduction or mitigation. 
Uh, and at the rest, as you know, we've, we've undertaken a study there, a quite a detailed study that looked at a range of options to try and reduce the risk associated with the rest. And the option that was chosen to take forward was, was the red option, which was using uh, alpine netting to protect the debris flow channels uh, and reduce the, the, the risk that occurs from large boulders and large debris occur, making its way to the road and potentially having a, a fairly significant impact on traffic. Uh, so we've completed all 14 phases of that netting now at the rest, and the last landslide that we had at the end of October was the biggest slide that we had for some significant time, and the netting actually, uh, in our eyes, worked uh, as expected. It, it withheld the biggest, largest boulders that we've ever seen, some of them the size of small cars, from making their way down onto the road itself. So what you saw in the pictures that were tweeted out and communicated more widely was a slurry, the, the mud and water that had made its way down to the carriageway. Uh, obviously, the OMR, the Old Military Road, is working very well in terms of trying to mitigate the impact on the distance. The times uh, vary in terms of when you join the back of the queue, but certainly removing that additional distance for travellers into Argyll and Butte is, is welcomed, I think. And it is a partnership approach with the local community, with all the stakeholders, with the tourism bodies, to try and ensure that the message is very key, and that is that Argyll and Butte is, is still open for business, even as we deal with these incidents as they occur. So this year we're spending an additional million pound at the rest itself, which will be on drainage, some planting preparation works, uh, additional monitoring, again leading the way in terms of the UK and the world in terms of monitoring landslides and trying to get an early point in terms of identifying the trigger of when we expect landslides to occur. We're also more widely down to 83 spending about £5 million on uh, the other sites, so Glen King Lass, which is further west, uh, Loch Shearer, uh, and Cairn Down, which was the scene of a landslide some years ago, which nearly took out one of the houses. Uh, and then further afield, the Part B of the study that they undertook, uh, improving some of the bends, uh, resurfacing, and some of the other, the other issues that had occurred over a number of years further down the 83. And also, this year, the Minister uh, announced the, the retrunking of a significant part of the trunk road from Kenna Craig to Campbelltown, which I guess shows the commitment in terms of the amount of investment that we're, we're trying to put into the road. So that's what we're doing in the 83. Uh, more widely, the 82, the schemes progress on the uh, Pulpit Rock and Cray and Larrick. I don't have in front of me the exact dates of when Pulpit Rock is due to open, but I can provide that to the committee uh, once I speak with my colleague Ainsley McLaughlin, director of the major projects. Thank, thank you very much indeed. Now, may, maybe just, uh, I mean, that's a pretty comprehensive uh, response, so th thanks for that. Um, moving a bit further north, uh, there seems to be a rumour emerging that, uh, um, that the A9 cameras, average speed cameras, may not, in fact, be switched on. Um, I wonder if you could give some, some clarity on that. Well, as a new minister, I saw that press coverage as well, and so have checked, and they are on, and they are operational. Um, it's as straightforward uh, as that. Now, we can go into the debate around it, but they are absolutely operational. Uh, th th thank, thank you for that. I mean, it might be worth just um, you know, covering some of the main issues that pertain to that. Obviously, there are people who are uh, in favour of the cameras and those who are not. Could you just sketch out the, the main arguments, please? Uh, I'm happy to go into the experience of it and turn to the experience of the Cabinet Secretary. Well, uh, uh, this issue, is, I think, has changed over time. I think uh, certainly a lot of the feedback, feedback I'm getting now uh, is that people feel it's um, a less stressful drive, that they feel more uh, at ease on the road. Um, there have been the expected uh, increase, small increases in journey times. Um, it's too early to say in terms of some of the other aspects. We'll have to wait and see what the Safety Camera Partnership um, publishes to do after uh, three months. But um, I, I remain convinced it's the right thing to do. Um, we said before that uh, based on the evidence that we have, and it can never be totally conclusive, but based on the evidence, if you can eliminate two uh, fatal or serious accidents a year, the cost of that, apart from the personal cost to the individuals involved, which is huge, is around £2 million per fatal accident. So it's £4 million uh, reduction if that was to happen over a period of years. Uh, but it was also necessary to do because we would have to put average speed cameras on those parts of the road which were being uh, dueled in any event. You do that for the safety of the workforce. And as I've mentioned already in my opening statement, the first of those uh, will start um, next year. So um, I, I believe it was the right thing to do. Um, I think a lot of those people who 
uh, have raised concerns, have raised concerns. Uh, for example, more recently there was a concern raised about um, whether traffic was going off the A9 to go and use other routes. Well, we've seen, I think, a 5% increase in the usage of the A9. So, um, and I don't think that's been borne out by the evidence that we have that people have been doing that. It's hard that you'll know the route better than I do, but even in my knowledge of the route, I can't think of um, shortcuts that would, would help you in, in relation to that. Um, it certainly wouldn't get you there faster. Um, so I think it was the right thing to do. Obviously, we did, said this was a pilot, so we will evaluate it over time, but I think it was the right thing to do in terms of increasing the safety. It does not stop and it does not hinder, it does not delay by one day the duelling of the A9. We'll do that as quickly as we can do. Now, I know people will say, well, yes, OK, you say you'll do it as quickly as you can, but I would say we said that in relation to the AWPR and we're doing that. We've said it in relation to another, a number of other projects and we're, we're doing them uh, quicker than previously estimated so we will try and do this as quickly as possible and I do accept the point that many people who are concerned about the average speed cameras have made which is that the best solution here is to duel the road we are doing that and we'll do it as quickly as we can I, I mean I have to commend the Scottish Government on taking a, you know, an evidence based approach to this so uh, and I know that a number of constituents are, that I'm in contact with are actually quite happy with the situation just if I can briefly convene or just with your indulgence move on to my final question which is about the uh, Stornoway Amapool ferry route. And I'm sure, sure that uh, you'll be aware that due to the construction of the new link span, the, the ferry is having to come off that uh, um, route and, and divert rather from Stornoway to Ugin Sky. Um, I think the main concern at the moment seems to be that Calmac perhaps haven't consulted this well as they may have done. Um, could, you, could you comment on that and perhaps give a bit of reassurance? Well, I think it was right to take the decision to do this. To, I mean, what you're going to end up with at the end of the process is a, a fantastic £43 million ferry which can take both passengers and freight and you're going to have improved port facilities in either port, both at Stornoway and Illapool. Um, I think it was right to do it at this time. However, I am uh, aware of the criticism that it could have been earlier consultation, whether it's by CMAL or by CALMAC. In any event, um, I've said to both CALMAC and CMAL that this should be done as a matter of course. Um, perhaps the information came out before they were ready to finalise their plans in order to alleviate any, uh, any changes which had to be made. So, but I, I have made the point, both to CALMAC and CMAL, they should consult as early as possible, but I do believe it's the right decision to have taken. And, you know, once the new boat's in operation and so on, that, that you expect a much more improved service of passenger experience? Well, I've, I've been on the new vessel. It's a fantastic vessel, and I think people obviously are very keen. Uh, there's no diminution to the service just now. Um, of course, we, we're serving that route both in terms of passengers and freight, but this um, new um, ship will have... Uh, vastly better uh, fuel consumption figures if you take the combined uh, passenger and freight services just now it's more efficient it's more environmentally friendly it's a very attractive vessel as well so it's um, something that people will notice i know they're very keen to see it happen as soon as possible and we'll get that chance uh, very shortly but um, i believe it also marks the fact we're investing substantially in that route and for the people in the islands yeah. thank you alex you have a question Thank you very much. Uh, if you'll indulge me, Ministers, uh, I was going to jump around a few of the road projects uh, just briefly. Uh, the first one was, on the subject of the A9 speed cameras, would it be possible to have some indication of the number of penalty notices that were issued in the first days and weeks after the cameras were switched on? I, I tried to sort of mention that uh, earlier in saying that we, we don't publish them. The uh, Safety Partnership will publish those figures and do that in a set uh, period, over a period of time, I think it's a three-monthly period. Perhaps Roy can come in and tell us, but there's no provision for us to go and say, give us an early snapshot of what happened in the first few days. We should get that information fairly soon, but they have a set process for doing this, which we're not going to deviate from. Do you want to mention that? Yeah, the Safety Camera Partnerships own, own the data. They, they're now operating the system. So, uh, you know, we installed it, but the partnerships now look after it and they manage it and operate on a daily basis. They won't release those figures uh, because it, it brings into... Uh, potential jeopardy the whole operation of the safety camera system so what they have agreed to do and there is a meeting today actually the chair of the road safety group Stuart sits beside me but there is a meeting today of the safety group uh, and the they'll be working towards uh, uh, dissemination of information in a quarterly basis so by January time well they'll provide some kind of performance statistics on exactly what the system is doing thank you very much uh, on a different subject, and please forgive me if you mentioned this earlier, because I got very excited when you gave us a completion date for the AWPR. Did you give us a similar date for the completion of the M8? 
Uh, I didn't give you a date. Um, it, as, it is as was previously mentioned. Do, are you, it's Ainsley that's is Ainsley here. Oh, it's not me. Um, do you have the dates for that one? Well, I can come back to the dates, but it's, there's no change to the previously published yeah. dates for that. And if you, I don't know if you've been there recently, you'll see a huge amount of work going on. Um, we have to go very deep um, at the Wraith Interchange, for example, because of ground conditions. Uh, but uh, there's no change, there's no delays to the programme. Uh, on the subject of the AWPR, as I said, I'm delighted that we now have progress and we have a potential completion date. Uh, but as you know, there's uh, always people uh, who have uh, concerns about junctions, and we're still dealing with one of the junctions that was improperly designed 30 years ago and looking for a conclusion. Uh, the, does the Minister have any views on the local campaign and the concerns there are regarding the junction at Stonehaven between the A90 and the Fast Link? as it's designed? Uh, no, I mean, that was obviously a decision taken, I think, in 2005, I think that decision was taken, but there's no... Um, I know there's a campaign locally that people prefer a different route, some people prefer a different route, but... Um, and that question was raised recently in the Parliament by uh, Nigel Don, but I think I made clear at that stage the last thing that we are going to do now is to reopen uh, that issue, which would require new road orders to be made, possibly a legal challenge to it, given previous history, I don't know, uh, and a substantial delay and cost to the project. So we don't intend to deviate from that. I hadn't heard as part of that concerns about the junction. It was more about the route that was being taken. Um, if you want to pass on those concerns about the junction, I'm happy to look at those, but I've not heard any expressed to me. Mm -hmm. I, I will take the opportunity to communicate on that. Uh, on a, a, another subject, just this very week, uh, there has been further news about uh, intentions by the UK government to make further uh, improvements to the A1 north of Newcastle. Now, as you know, the, there has been a huge amount of work done on the A1 uh, to the south uh, to upgrade it to motorway, and there's now a, a largely a, an East Coast motorway network within the United Kingdom. Uh, Given that the UK government have now uh, committed to a further uh, section of dueling in that area north of Newcastle, uh, is there an opportunity here for the Scottish government to work in conjunction with the UK government to look at uh, dueling the road from uh, or completing the dueling between Edinburgh and Newcastle to give Edinburgh and the east of Scotland full access to that East Coast motorway network? Well, I think, first of all, even if it was the case that we were to say that would be uh, something we wanted to do, then that would not affect uh, the duelling between Edinburgh and Newcastle because parts, even if this project goes ahead, which has been announced this week by the UK government, that will not complete the duelling uh, south of the border. So it will not be duelled to the border uh, from the south. Uh, our view on it is that the A1 uh, is, is assessed regularly. It performs well. It's below the national average in terms of accidents per kilometre. Uh, what we have said, though, is we provided information to the UK government, or at least said we're willing to provide information to the UK government on the information that we hold in relation to the road. Uh, we do keep it under review, but it serves its purpose um, just now. Uh, and uh, I think if it was the case, I think we were told maybe a year or so ago the intention of the UK government was to duel it to the border uh, in its entirety. That seems to have changed now, where they have also... Uh, taking a decision which will result in them having parts of the road duelled. I think we have a substantial section of the A1 duel, but not all of it. So given its road usage uh, and given uh, the financial constraints that we're under, we don't have a plan to, to duel the A1 down to the border, just as the UK government will not have a plan to duel it from south of the border. And just come back to the previous question that Mr Johnson asked and to say that the M8 bundle uh, will be spring 2017 for completion date. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, uh, thanks, Convener. In addition to these major trunk road projects, of course, the STPR um, laid out a number of other smaller scale um, uh, road, road improvements, um, which would tackle things like uh, improving connectivity, reducing journey times, tackling congestion. Uh, and, and there's a notable one in my own constituency with the Mabel Bypass, which I know has been progressed up to the point, I, I think this summer, it, uh, it will achieve shovel-ready status. Um, the question arises, um, given the success you've had in terms of keep, keeping the major projects um, to budget and even under budget, and uh, appropriately on time as well, 
uh, would it be, when would it be possible to actually advance some of these smaller uh, projects, or is that on the cards? Um, I'm just looking for a little um, <coughs> encouragement for, for people um, that these projects will actually come on stream in the not too distant future. Hey, I, I think, uh, obviously, I know the, the Mabel bypass situation and also the, the current situation going through uh, the main street and how close the traffic, sometimes very heavy traffic, passes to even individuals on very uh, narrow um, pavements. I think in relation to that project and a number of others, what we've said is where we think there's real merit. We've gone through the process, uh, as you've described, of um, both the planning, uh, the road orders uh, process, to get them to a stage which we're not at yet with, with Mabel. I think there are some planning issues from memory still to be resolved there. But um, when, we, when we get to that, that end of that process, if that road is then ready for it, we still have to look to get the money to do that. Um, and in the past, that's often been allowed by, uh, if you get consequentials money, we'll find out today whether there's any consequentials. I'm a little bit sceptical there will be, given, I think, Dan Alexander said on TV the other night that this was really the detail of previous announcements. But um, sometimes we've had consequentials money, um, which has allowed us to take forward projects which were a bit further behind. Uh, our priorities are, as you quite rightly mentioned, those big projects. So the A9 and the A96 will end up with a situation where all Scotland's cities are joined by either motorway or dual carriers. We think that's important strategically. But where we have the um, possibility, and there's other ones, Berrydale Braes I mentioned previously, Mabel Bypass is another. I don't know if it was the Lawrence Kirk Junction that uh, Mr Johnson was referring to earlier on is, is one that's been mentioned before, or we think there's a, an issue about developer contribution uh, there. It really does depend on the money becoming available. And given the background, which is the 26% cut to our capital projects, what we're increasingly having to do is look at innovative ways of financing this. So both in relation to the M8 bundle and in relation to the AWPR, it's through not-for-profit trust, um, a non-profit distributing trust uh, that we're tackling that, these different ways of trying to finance it. So the two things which can help us advance some of those less substantial projects, if I can put it that way, are if we happen to get money from um, consequentials or some other unforeseen source, or if we can figure out new ways to attract funding in, and we're constantly examining those. That's perhaps a, a bigger part of the job that I'm now doing than it was previously in terms of capital uh, investment and infrastructure. So we are looking at that and we're well aware of the projects like the, the one that you, you quite rightly mentioned, the Mabel Bypass, where there's an awful lot of local support for these things to happen. Okay, thank you. Lady, you have questions on active travel. Thank you, Convener. Um, an updated version of the Cycle Action Plan was published in June 2013, which included the shared vision for 10% of everyday trips to be taken by bike by 2020. I wonder if you could um, tell the committee if we are on track to meet that target um, and what are the, the current and future plans to, to assist in meeting that target. And I know part of that is about um, behaviour change. So if you can maybe talk a bit about um, not just the infrastructure programmes, but how you're, you're carrying out the behaviour change that's required. If I can start, uh, convener, I think that's a very important question. Uh, there has to be a behavioural shift mm. and a change. It isn't just about infrastructure, mm. although infrastructure is important. So there has been the updated uh, action plan uh, ongoing work with local authorities. Employer schemes are also to be um, supported as well in terms of uh, active travel. And this year, a further development around uh, infrastructure is the National Walking Cycling Network uh, as well, which prioritises that in terms of uh, both the planning process and then uh, infrastructure that can be delivered. There's been cycling, a very successful uh, cycling summit as well, working in partnership with local authorities and various pots of funding to support active uh, travel. So I think there's a package of measures that should further progress uh, active travel. But that shared vision is a shared vision and is a longer term one, but there has to be that behavioural shift where people see it as more attractive to get out of the car uh, and onto the bike or, or walk, particularly on those short journeys uh, where it can be achieved. So it's a mixture of infrastructure behaviour uh, and promotion. Uh, and again, Mr Brown may be uh, able to add more to, to what I've just said. Yeah, we also have the, the National uh, Walking Strategy uh, as uh, 
Mr McKay has mentioned we've had the cycling summit. The first one I think we held um, last year, which um, I, I took the decision to cycle to. It was 17 miles, and I'm just about recovered now, I think. Um, but that was also about telling people it was in, held in Edinburgh, which uh, is perhaps the city that's done more than any other in terms of trying to improve both uh, infrastructure and improve behaviour, um, and also just encourage cycling. I think the other big thrust of what we're trying to do is through the school, so increased training for children at school uh, and where we can, uh, rolling out the idea it should be on the road training, because in the past it would tend to be playgrounds, and which are not uh, always reflective of uh, the pressures that you get on the road network. Um, so we, we've, we've tried to encourage it through schools. If you can get somebody involved in cycling at that age and hopefully can continue uh, throughout their lives. We're uh, looking further, uh, along with uh, my colleagues um, previously, Paul Wheelhouse, um, Alistair Allen in terms of schools, um, and Shona Robinson in terms of health. It's for the first time, I think, some cross-portfolio work can go on to see how we can encourage that. So also areas where you have large preponderances of stu uh, students uh, in an urban setting trying to change uh, behaviours uh, there as well. I would say that the infrastructure really goes hand in hand, because one reason why uh, if we're honest, there's an inhibition on cycling to school. will often be the fears of parents about uh, the safety of their children. So if you can improve uh, cycle routes to schools such that it gives the parents additional reassurance, uh, then the infrastructure improvement you've made can lead to changes in behaviour as well. But uh, you, you're right to say that it's, it, it's the two things together. Uh, some of the infrastructure work, there's one in my own constituency between Tilly Kutri and Alva, a fantastic uh, facility which is open there. There's ones in uh, Stirling where we're expanding the national cycle network. That sometimes is more a case of um, attracting people to come to the country for recreational purposes for cycling, but also uh, people within Scotland seeing these opportunities opening up, knowing that it's safe, uh, knowing that it's designed for their purposes. Um, that starts to change behaviour where people start to say, I'll take a, a cycling or an active break rather than uh, some other form of break. So the two things do link uh, well together. And, and where are we in relation to the target? Are we on, tra are we on track to meet the target of 10% by 2020? Well, I think you mentioned at the start a shared vision. That was a shared aspiration. It's not just down to the government. It's between the local authorities and all the different agencies. Um, I think it is true to say that what we uh, expected would happen has happened, which is that the early investment in behavioural change has to take time to work through. So we still intend, that's what we're aiming for, the 10% by 2020. Um, but uh, I think it's a question of the early hard work has been done. We want to start seeing some real progress towards that, uh, that shared ambition uh, soon. OK, thank you. Transport Scotland published their long-term vision for active travel in, in Scotland um, 2030 in November. And Cabinet Secretary, when you were then the Transport Minister, um, you said it was a document which sets out how we hope Scotland will look in 2030 if more people are walking and cycling for short everyday journeys, allowing us to reap the benefits of active travel. So what is the status of that document? And where does it fit in with the policies that are, that are part of the, um, the Cycling Action Plan and the National Walking Strategy? Well, the Cycling Action Plan and National Walking Strategy stand on their own merits, and they have uh, the detail uh, in there to see how we can uh, move forward. But they, the idea behind that, and it was my own idea, was to try and get all the stakeholders in and see, try and think out with even that. That was, you know, say it was last year, so seven years before 2020. Thinking longer term, thinking about some of the examples that we're often confronted with, say, in, in the Netherlands or in Denmark, how would you want it to look in 2030? What would what would the achievement of your ideals mean? How would it look? So that, that was the idea behind that. And I suppose it's to try and feed into what the decisions that we take now to say, how can we actually achieve that? So there was a great deal of emphasis, for example, on 20 mile an hour zones, not all of which are in our gift. That will be up to local authorities to implement those, although there is a demand on the government that we make it easier for that to be achieved. Um, so the, the 2030 thing was, um, it took some time to do. We had some fantastic buy-in from the, the stakeholders, all the different organisations, and obviously everybody, to get to that finalised vision, had to make a bit of a compromise. But I think it's a very good exercise. I think for Transport Scotland, but for planning officials across the country as well, to say, actually, that's that's what we're trying to achieve. Yeah, that's that's how things might look if we get planning by design right to, and these things right as well. So that was the purpose of it. It doesn't undermine, but I think uh, helps us with the walking plan and the, the other targets that we have before. 
So as, as, as your view that it's, if every strategy is, is complementary and they all fit together yeah. in a complementary fashion. Yeah. yeah. I think that the, the, the vision uh, that we came up with helps to inform that strategy. It just it gives a picture. I suppose if you uh, are an official in the government and there's officials here who can speak for themselves, but if you are constantly working towards the next five or six years and you're looking at specific projects, it maybe helps just to have that sort of vision further on in mind as you're doing those things. Okay, thank you. Thank you, convener. Thank you. Um, just s staying with um, sustainable and active travel, this is an issue which this committee has looked at as part of its um, scrutiny of the draft budget and the allocation of expenditure uh, on areas that can be expected to, to impact on our climate change um, emissions and, and the attainment of our climate change targets. It's, it's an issue that I also asked the, the Deputy First Minister, now our First Minister, about when she came before the committee. And that was the perceived lack of clarity on how much money is actually being invested. Because it strikes me that if there is a good story to tell and the government maintains that they are doing more than ever before to invest in active travel, um, we're missing an opportunity to make people aware of that investment because a lot of the investment and expenditure is incorporated in different budget lines in the draft budget. And one of the things that Sustrans said to us in written evidence, and I quote, uh, and Sustrans are highly respected in this area, as you know, at present it is well nigh impossible to accurately ascertain how much money will be directed towards active travel as the figure is so buried away within other funding pots. This situation must be resolved imminently. Now, this is an issue that I've raised in the chamber with the Cabinet Secretary for Finance. I know there's a willingness to try and provide further clarity, but we don't seem to be making the progress that the stakeholders would like to see on this issue. Yeah, well, I will uh, take that up with Sustrans convener. I, I think there was um, a question, I can't remember which member had asked it, where we did, uh, whether it was myself or whether it was Mr Swinney, gave um, as clear as I think we could make the account of where money was being spent. I mean, at the start you mentioned um, sustainable and low carbon transport, I think, as well. Maybe that's where some of the confusion has come in. There are different pots of money, I accept that point. Um, but I take the point you made on board. Uh, I'll maybe check out that response that was given previously, because my recollection, it was a very clear account. For example, 2014-15 uh, through to 2015-16, um, in terms just of sustainable and active travel, we're talking about um, uh, £34 million pounds being spent compared to a previous amount of £25 million. Pounds. Total funding to support active travel 2012 to 13 through to 2015-16 is likely to be around £100 million, pounds, uh, although some of that depends on discussions and decisions resulted to take in relation to future transport funds <coughs> and local authority grants. That's also a complicating factor because with Sustrans, rather, uh, we give money which they often have to get uh, match funding for from local authorities. If I can look out that answer, if I can provide that to yourself, convener, uh, for the committee's benefit, and if you think there's further we need to uh, further we need to travel in terms of making sure we make that as clear as possible, I'm happy to do that. We're obviously in the middle of the budget round just now, and I'll pass that on as well to the Deputy First Minister. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, can I move on to the issue or one that's close to the hearts of all Edinburgh MSPs, and that is the Edinburgh trams. The trams are now up and running in the city, which is obviously something that we all welcome, and the First Minister announced that there would be a public inquiry on the 5th of June, and the then Deputy First Minister announced in November that that inquiry would be placed on a statutory footing. Now, clearly, there remain a lot of questions that the public would like to see answered um, and explored through that inquiry, why the project incurred delays, why the cost is now considerably more than originally budgeted for, and why the tram project was not able to deliver um, the network uh, that was originally envisaged uh, when it was first, first mooted. Can you provide an update on the inquiry into the, the project, including when you expect it to report and how much you expect the inquiry to cost? I think, first of all, to say you're right, the latest information we have is a decision that was taken uh, by the First Minister to convert this to a, a statutory inquiry. Uh, and that goes back to the previous decision where we um, proposed a non-statutory inquiry um, because we believe that could be more um, 
uh, quickly dealt with and also wouldn't have the same cost attached to it, potentially. However, it was very clear from Lord Hardy's early experience that some of the witnesses that he wanted to have or people he wanted to speak to wouldn't appear without the backing of a statutory inquiry. It's not just a question of using a legal force to make people appear, it's to give assurance to people as well in relation to other legal action which might be taken. Um, and if it is, as we uh, have said, it will be a properly independent inquiry, then both the timescale for it and the cost will be determined by the head of the inquiry, in this case, uh, Lord Hardy. All I can say is that Lord Hardy, I know, is well aware of the urgency with which people want to see this being uh, uh, dealt with. He, he knows that and he's making as much progress as he can, but the length of the inquiry will be determined by, as is the case in all statutory inquiries, by the person leading the inquiry. And obviously, um, if you're talking about uh, over a decade of material, huge amounts of material, uh, many individuals who are no longer uh, on the scene, if you like, or local to the area who've gone uh, elsewhere, then I think you can see the complexity of the inquiry. But all I can say is that Lord Hardy himself is well aware of the need to do this as quickly as he possibly can. But having said that, he'll want to do it in a proper uh, and, and efficient manner. Uh, there's nothing further you can say no. about the cost at this stage? No, I, I generally could not uh, give you a, a, an estimate of the cost. Obviously, we've seen other inquiries become uh, very expensive for, for very different reasons um, uh, and delays for different reasons. But um, as I say, I think I do take some comfort from the fact that I know Lord Hardy wants to deal with this as quickly as is possible, consistent with doing it in the right way. OK, thank you for that. Uh, Adam, you want to ask about the borders, really? Yes. Um, is there anything that you'd like to add to, uh, to your opening remarks uh, where you mentioned uh, the Borders Railway um, Cabinet Secretary in terms of an update in progress and um, the project remains <coughs> on time and budget? Um, anything you want to add to, it, to what you said? One thing I would like to add, if I could, uh, if given the chance, is just how exciting a project this is. Um, I think it's true to say, and I think Mr Johnson might appreciate this in relation to the AWPR, uh, we didn't perhaps understand exactly how sceptical local people were about whether this would happen until they actually saw construction on site. Um, but since that's happened, uh, the level of enthusiasm and interest in this project has really grown. I went down to see the uh, phenomenal track laying machine which is used to lay the track and uh, the level of interest there and support for the project uh, was huge. I think what's happened uh, mainly due to the intervention of the former First Minister um, in terms of uh, making sure that we exploit fully the tourist potential of this um, since then has also added to that uh, interest and excitement. Obviously, my uh, responsibility um, was to make sure the project um, proceeded and we got on with it as quickly as we could and stayed within the budget. Uh, those things are happening. Uh, we expect very shortly to have the line completed in terms of the track laid. Um, and beyond that, what we then have to have are the stations constructed and the um, the driver training, which is essential in any new route. But the, the interest and the excitement about this project is, is certainly building now. And of course, uh, September next year, that will come to a head. And I mean, even for members uh, in the parliament here to say how excited they are, knowing the area to see uh, trains returning to this area for the first time in 40 years is, is building. So it's a complex project. Um, there's a lot of work going into it. We all know it's had a troubled history in the past, but it's. Um, to use the overused pun, it's, it's well on track and, and very exciting. Thank you very much. OK, James, you want to ask about the fourth replacement crossing? Much a similar question. If you could give us an update on the construction progress on the Queen's Bay crossing, confirm whether the project remains on time and budget, and if there's any other comments you'd like to make. Hey, we're well under budget. I mentioned in the opening statement uh, the recent uh, £50 million pounds, uh, reduction in the estimated cost, but even that, uh, that takes you down to around about 1.4 below that, in fact, uh, billion pounds. I think when this project was tendered, it was between 1.75 and 2.25 billion pounds, um, and we're now down at 1.4 billion pounds. As I said, it's on schedule. It's always been the case that the anticipated completion date was December 2016. Uh, and again, like the other projects I just mentioned, I get regularly asked because people can see the approach roads on either side taking shape. You know, is it almost ready to open? If you cross the existing fourth road bridge, you'll realise why it's not about to open very shortly. Um, 
unless you had a, a special type of vehicle that James Bond used to use. But um, so you can people can see the towers coming out, um, and they can see the real progress that's being made there. They can see the progress with the approach roads, and, and sometimes the program goes back and forth. It's true of all these big programs, especially at big projects, especially when you're uh, doing uh, something like a bridge or, or, over a body of water like that. But um, it is well uh, under budget, and it's uh, on schedule for completion in December 2016. Thank you, Alex. Well, I'm delighted to see the bridge coming on and uh, the, the success that the project has been. But in the early days of this project, some of the prices that were being banded around were so high and so wide of the mark, let's say, that they may even have threatened the, the, the future of the project. How did we manage to get that so wrong? Uh, and what have we learned from the change in the cost of the project as it goes along? It's an interesting question because, you know, at the point when we started to see substantial reductions in the estimate, it changed from being this is uh, too expensive to why are you getting it in so cheap, and there must be something uh, some issue here. But um, uh, you're right. I think if you go back to 2005, 2006, even I think some of the comments in the media were five or six billion pounds were talked about for this crossing. Uh, and I think some of the earlier work done before I was in post by John Swinney and um, Stuart Stevenson uh, helped get um, a type of bridge which could help bring the price down. I think part of the reductions in the cost, though, are associated with the fact that because of the nature of the project and the fact the Scottish Government had to underwrite it, essentially pay for it from current revenue, the Scottish Government also had to underwrite um, both inflation and the risks associated with um, you know, bad weather and, and things like that. And I think we all know what's happened with inflation over recent years. That's certainly helped. Uh, and the, the, there's been some very tight project management by uh, Transport Scotland and others. So I think those things have been genuine contributions to driving down the price. I mean, it's an example which we use for other projects as well to see if we can do that. But there are things about the fourth um, crossing which are distinctive in terms of, as I've said, the government underwriting the inflation, uh, had inflation been substantially higher than the Scottish Government have had to take on board that cost. So there are things which are unique to it, but there are things which have been done which have made that a very efficient um, uh, project and have no reason to believe that uh, the market uh, uh, um, misread it uh, or, or that we had the wrong price in there from the start. I think we've got a very keen price and we've made sure we've stuck to that and where we could we've reduced that. Thank you. Maybe you have the final question on question on winter resilience. Winter is almost upon us and many people around the country will be bracing themselves for perhaps transport um, difficulties. Now Transport Scotland launched its Ready for Winter campaign in November and there are improved preparations for dealing with severe weather on the Trump Road <laughs> network. So are you satisfied that Transport Scotland, Network Rail and bus operating companies are prepared for the severe weather and can you give us an update on the improvements they've made to their, their preparations? There has been a, a range of uh, improvements and uh, preparation uh, is, is key of course in, in winter. Mm -hmm. um, today or this morning was the first major frost I think we've experienced um, so gritters were, were out and were dispatched of course uh, to deal with that. Um, the partnership approach always uh, assists here across the public sector with private operators as well, and crucially, uh, as Mary Fee knows, with local authorities. In terms of the uh, campaigns, as the public information campaigns it launched by the Cabinet Secretary, one of the campaigns, of course, was launched in my own constituency, as it happens at Snow Zone at, at Brayhead, in terms of that. There are more sources of information, and sources of information in a way that the public and the travelling public would want to access them through apps and Twitter. I think we've got over 60,000 followers to Traffic uh, Scotland. In relation to that, in my first week in post, I was able to visit the National Traffic uh, Control Centre to look at the multi-agency work that's going on in terms of the coordination, should there be pressure points and uh, incidents, because, of course, it's not just snow and ice, it's wind and rain and flooding can cause major disruption as well. So in all of that, there's increased preparation. Uh, one of the first questions, of course, I asked when I came into post is what is our stock 
of salts uh, at, and they are at a satisfactory level. A higher, um, a higher stock now uh, than uh, before. So in every sense, we're putting in every effort to ensure that we're prepared, that necessary information is out there, that we've updated uh, new ways of working and technology so that more people can, can access information, including whilst uh, they're travelling uh, in a safe way. So all of that leads me to the conclusion that we are satisfied with the plans in place, but of course with a severe weather incident, then we have to be adept at what, we, what, we're, what we're able to do. But partners continue to work very closely on the uh, forecasting and the approach uh, that we'll take. And so far, it has been a relatively mild winter. Uh, long may that continue, but we'll ensure that we're fully prepared for the period ahead. Hopefully that answers the member's question. Thank you. A particular problem in the past has been the provision of real-time information. So perhaps um, you could explain to committee what improvements have been made to that. Well, of course, people need to access information uh, safely. So as well as the Twitter uh, uh, feed and the websites, we also have the radio facility where we can centrally uh, record and broadcast um, uh, hotspots and uh, difficulties that passengers uh, and uh, travellers may be uh, experiencing. So we've got more uh, up-to-date live information being disseminated uh, than before, and there's a range of different sources where that can be used. And mobile apps it is increasingly used, and we'll put further investment into that uh, ahead. So it's a mixture of being prepared, uh, have full cognizance of the warnings that have been issued, all, all our agencies understanding what's going on in the transport networks across the country and conveying that in whatever method is appropriate. So that's internet, uh, media, uh, multi-agency organisations through the communication channels, the multi-agency approach at the control centres, uh, and ensuring there's good lines of communication direct to the public. But our own, I'm not sure how old the radio broadcasting service is, but I've also volunteered to do a broadcast myself. I understand the Cabinet Secretary has done so. But if there's technology out there to be used, we're certainly uh, exploring it to ensure that all the real-time data and information we have on what's happening, what the weather forecasts are, where the uh, uh, issues may arise, is out there for public consumption. Thank you. Whatever you do, Minister, don't accept any last-minute invites to appear on Newsnight. I'll, I'll take uh, on board that advice from Mr Johnston. <laughs> well, I the committee. What, what's the nature of the broadcast that you and the Cabinet Secretary are recording? Well, that was more in jest. The serious broadcasts are actually daily where our operators record uh, traffic and travel information, uh, including, I would imagine, the uh, uh, weather warnings as well. And that can be uh, passed to commercial operators. We're simply volunteering our services uh, to, to assist with that broadcast should it be required in terms of a public information or, or, or so on. But there is that uh, permanent base here to have pre-recorded updates based on information or live updates that can then be sent to the commercial radio operators to uh, ensure as wide saturation of our warnings as is possible. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, Mark, did you have a question? Yep. Um, just to ask if there's been any progress made since the publication of the ACOM report on the Glasgow Airport su Surface Access improvements and some of the <coughs> recommendations within that report. In my uh, previous role as Minister for Local Government and Planning, uh, of course, Scottish Government signed up with UK Government and the local authorities there, the City Deal. And within the city deal was a key project around surface access to Glasgow Airport. And in my current role, I'll continue to meet with the airport and uh, our agencies to discuss how we take that forward. But essentially, as a city deal project, um, the local authorities will determine how they choose to take forward their city deal projects. But we'll continue to work closely with uh, Glasgow Airport and any other partnership uh, to... Uh, address it, uh, but it is now a city deal project in terms of that surface access as a project in terms of uh, that uh, transport option, but there will be further discussions direct with Glasgow Airport. Okay, just on one of the recommendations, I think the previous Minister's um, preferred option was the, the tram 
train option. I wonder if you're able to comment on the feasibility of delivery on that, and have you had any discussions with Network Rail um, since their pilot project between Rotherham and Sheffield? Um, after it was delayed for a year, is now delayed again because of signalling issues between the, the tram and, and train networks. If if that option is still <coughs> deliverable, and, um, how discussions with Network Rail have gone on that? Well, Mr Griffin will be aware that um, I don't think that was just a view of the Minister. If memory serves me correctly, that was the best option uh, from the report that, that came out top in terms of a uh, best option. Uh, but uh, our officials will be happy to support the City Deal partnership in taking this project forward. But the City Deal is a, a funding package which essentially allows the councils to take forward uh, their proposals and Glasgow Airport access through rail is now their proposal. Now, we'll be as supportive as we can be and we'll study all necessary uh, information, but it's no longer the case that Transport Scotland or the Scottish Government leads this project. That's what City Deal in terms of empowering local authorities and allowing them the financial freedom to get on with it uh, creates the conditions so to do, and we will be as supportive as we can be. Uh, can I invite the panellists to make any concluding remarks that you wish to make? Yeah, I don't have any concluding remarks to make, uh, 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 Convener, but uh, as ever, uh, either myself or, or Ms Mackay are happy to come to the committee at any time to address the issues that are of concern to you. Okay, thank you. Can I thank all of the, the panellists for their evidence this morning, not just for bringing a smile to Mike McKenzie's face, but for answering all of our questions so fully and comprehensively. And can I now briefly suspend the meeting to allow the witnesses to leave?
welcome um, this meeting of the committee. The fifth item for today is the consideration of the negative instrument on notice of potential liability for costs, discharge notice Scotland order 2014, SSI 2014-313. The purpose of this order is to prescribe under the Housing Scotland Act 2014 the form of notices of discharge of potential liability for costs issued under the Title Conditions Scotland Act 2003 and Tenement Scotland Act 2004. The Committee will now consider any issues that it wishes to raise in reporting to the Parliament on this instrument. Members should note that no motions to annul have been received in relation to this instrument and I invite comments from members. In that case, is the committee agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to this instrument? Agreed. Thank you. Uh, that concludes the committee's business in public today, and we will now move to private session as previously agreed. Thank